Welcome to, to, welcome to today's webinar, Occupational Licensing, Assessing State Policy and, and Practice Populations webinar, brought to you by NCSL. It is now my pleasure to turn the floor over to Suzanne Fulton. The floor is yours. Great. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. This is Suzanne Holtine with the National Conference of State Legislatures. Before we get started, I have a few housekeeping items to go over. First off, this presentation is available to download during the webinar. It can be accessed via the Media Library, which is the Play button in the upper right-hand corner next to the telephone. This webinar will be archived within one week. Please go to ncsl.org slash webinars to access all webinar archives. And you can ask a question at any time by entering it into the box located on the lower left-hand side of the screen. I am pleased you can join us to hear more about this partnership project on occupational licensing and specifically about the challenges four different population groups face when seeking to obtain an occupational license or work in a licensed occupation in another state. This project is funded through the U.S. Department of Labor's Employment and Training Administration and is a partnership between NCSL, the National Governors Association for Best Practices, and the Council of State Governments. In just a moment, all three organizations will have the opportunity to introduce themselves. First, I want to quickly run through our agenda. Following the organization instructions, I will share a little bit more about our three-year project. Then you will hear from my colleague, Iris Hensey, who will give a quick overview as to why we are focusing on these four population groups. Following Iris, you will hear from four experts at NCSL who will walk us through the specific challenges these populations face with occupational licensing and the actions some states have taken to ease these burdens. Finally, we will have time at the end for Q&A. We will save questions for the end of the webinar, but as you are listening to our presenters, please feel free to type a question in the box located in the lower left-hand corner. For those of you who are not familiar with the National Conference of State Legislatures, we are the membership organization for all state legislators and legislative staff in all 50 states and territories. We are a bipartisan organization that provides research, technical assistance, professional development, and opportunities for legislators and, leg and staff to exchange ideas. We also advocate on behalf of state legislatures before Congress. NCSL is your resource for information on what is going on in the state legislatures, so please don't hesitate to utilize our research and expertise. And now I'm going to turn it over with, to Jeff King with the National Governors Association. Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, so for those of you who aren't familiar with NGA, uh, we are the uh, membership organization of the nation's governors. Uh, similar to NCSL, we are a bipartisan organization that uh, uh, assists uh, governors in all 50 states and uh, the territories in um, uh, working on common uh, issues of uh, public policy and governance at the state and national levels. Uh, we have a center for best practices in-house, which uh, our staff that are working on this project are uh, um, part of that uh, is involved in assisting governors and their senior staff members in developing and imp implementing innovative policy solutions. Um, and uh, we're really excited to be working uh, on this project with our colleagues at NCSL and CSG. Uh, you know, this is an area that really involves a lot of different levels of, of government, and uh, we feel like uh, we have a, a great he team here to, to make an impact on that and, and help states uh, work through um, their uh, challenges and goals related to occupational licensing. So uh, thank you, Suzanne. Thank you. And now Dan Logson with CSG. Uh, thanks, Suzanne. Um, Council of State Governments was founded in 1933. It's our nation's only organization serving all three branches of state government. CSG is a region-based forum that fosters the exchange of uh, insights and ideas to help state officials shape public policy. Uh, we offer uh, unparalleled regional, national, and international opportunities to network, develop leaders, collaborate, and create problem-solving partnerships among governments. Uh, we have a number of affiliate organizations, such as the National Association of State Technology Directors, the National Emergency Management Association, which administers the Emergency Management uh, Compact for states, and the State International Development Organization, or CITO. And like NGO, we are uh, gratified and excited to be a part of this uh, exciting project and uh, look forward to working with uh, in our partners are uh, the consortium NCSL and NGA. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dan. Well, thank you to our partners. We are very excited to be working with them on this project, Occupational Licensing, Assessing State Policy and Practice. In January, the partners were awarded a grant from the U.S. Department of Labor's Employment and Training Administration to examine occupational licensing in the states. Jobs that require an occupational license, which is government approval to practice a profession, has grown significantly over the last 60 years from 1 in 20 to almost 1 in 4. When implemented properly, occupational licensing can help protect the health and safety of consumers. However, the many differences and disparities in licensing laws across states create additional barriers to those looking to enter the workforce and relocate across state lines. The primary ob objectives of the project are to look at ways states can reduce barriers to, labor, to the labor market, ensuring licenses, licensing requirements are not overly burdensome or restrictive, and improve the portability of occupations across state lines. The project has an additional focus on identifying and addressing current policies that create unnecessary barriers to the labor market for populations with unique challenges. And this, these populations we will discuss on today's webinar. The heart of the three-year project is the Policy Learning Consortium. This peer learning consortium will bring together teams from 11 states to learn more about occupational licensing in their own states, as well as best practices from across the country. The 11 states were selected through a competitive grant process this summer and are listed on this slide. Broadly, with facilitation of the partner organizations, the consortium states will develop action plans which will determine their priorities and strategies to reduce barriers to the labor market, and the partners will support them in developing concrete steps and implementation to that end goal. Along with working specifically with the consortium states, the partners will also provide 50 state data and research on more than 30 regulated occupations, all which require less than a four-year degree. And we will be compiling briefs and information on each of these four population groups. There will also be ongoing webinars like this one, blogs and magazine articles highlighting this project and our work and research on occupational licensing throughout the three years of the project. And all of this information will be available on our partner webpage at ncsl.org slash states license. And so with that, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Iris Hensey. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. So we have four different distinct target populations for this project. Um, occupational licensing can create barriers to entry in the labor market for all workers, but some populations are disproportionately affected. Populations that already have trouble accessing resources that can help them get, get work can find economic barriers to entry too much to overcome to break into professions that require licensure. For this project, our target populations include military veterans and their spouses. This population group tends to have skills that they have gained through the military or elsewhere, but they may have a difficult time transferring their experience to the civilian workforce. Our next population is people with criminal backgrounds which can be partially or wholly restricted from entering many licensed and unlicensed occupations. Our next population group is immigrants with work authorization who face difficulty in obtaining recognition for foreign education of credentials um, or, or credentials, limited English language proficiency, and an unfamiliarity with US labor market and licensing requirements. And our final target population, unemployed and dislocated workers, may lack the resources needed to pay for the required education and training, as well as licensing fees, license renewal fees, and other necessary associated costs. To start off, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Jen Schultz, who will talk about um, military veterans and their spouses. Hi, everyone. My name is Jennifer Schultz. I cover military and veterans affairs for NCSL. My goal today is to introduce you to the population of veterans and military spouses, who they are, where they live, describe the main barriers to employment that they face, and finally, an overview of state action, including occupational licensing laws. There are 18.8 .8 million veterans living in the US today. That's 7.6% of the population. And there are approximately 1 million military spouses. This includes spouses of active duty members of the Armed Forces, National Guard, and Reserves. 
These graphics give you a sense of the U.S. veteran population. The population is 91.6% male and 8.3% female. Women are actually the fastest growing group of veterans, and projections show they will make up 20% of the total veteran population in the next 30 years. Most veterans are 65 and older, but there is a sizable number in every age cohort. Most veterans alive today served in the Vietnam era or peacetime, though the number of Gulf War era veterans increases every year. Not surprisingly, veterans live in every state and community in the U.S. The five states with the most veterans are, in order, California, Texas, Florida, Pennsylvania, and New York. Veterans make up more than 10% of the population in six states, Alaska, Virginia, Montana, Wyoming, Maine, and Hawaii. Military spouses are predominantly female and younger than civilian spouses. They are also more likely to have children at home. Military spouses are relatively well-educated. 84% have completed some college, 25% have a bachelor's degree, and 10% have a graduate degree. This is probably the most telling statistic. Military personnel are required to move about once every two to three years to bases in other states or countries. Because of this, military spouses move between states 10 times more frequently than their civilian counterparts. As you can imagine, the frequent moves disrupt all aspects of life, including employment. So what is the employment situation of this group? For veterans as a whole, the employment situation has greatly improved. The veteran unemployment rate peaked in 2010 at 9.4% and up to 12% for post-9-11 veterans. Today, the overall number is 4.3% or lower. But the rate for post-9-11 veterans is still higher than non-veterans. And the rate varies by state, ranging from 1.8% in Indiana to 7.6% in D.C. For military spouses, the picture is a bit different. Estimates put the unemployment rate somewhere between 12 and 32 percent, and one-third of military spouses report being underemployed. Military spouses also earn 38 percent less than their civilian peers. The higher the education level, the larger the income gap. Here are some of the top barriers to employment for veterans. Listed first is occupational licensing. Active duty service members receive extensive training in a wide range of occupational specialties. Many of these specialties have direct or proximate equivalents in the civilian workforce, but transitioning service members need the civilian credential required by state or federal law in order to secure employment. Despite all of their skills and experience, veterans often face long delays and financial costs to enter the workforce in a licensed profession. Other barriers include difficulty translating military skills into civilian terms and self-marketing. Veterans also report negative stereotypes as a barrier. Employers may be hesitant to hire over fears of PTSD, anger management, or other reasons. Disability status also plays a role. 22% of veterans have a service-connected disability. And in some cases, discharge classification is also an issue. There are five types of military discharges. Anything less than honorable can have a significant impact on that person's ability to achieve government employment and get access to benefits. Several factors impact, if not impede, military spouse employment. Licensure transferability. As many as 35% of military spouses work in a field that requires licensure. With frequent moves, a spouse may feel he or she is not in an, any location long enough to justify the cost or effort to obtain a new license, 
or they may not meet eligibility requirements in the new state. As I've alluded to, the cross-state moves are a major barrier. It increases the number of job changes, the number of gaps in employment, and chances for periods of unemployment over time. Geographic location also impacts employment opportunities. Many bases are located in rural areas that might not have jobs to match a spouse's skills and education. Parenting responsibilities are also a challenge. Many military spouses are effectively single parents during a deployment. All states and Puerto Rico have enacted some type of law or laws to assist veterans and military spouses in transferring and obtaining occupational licenses, many in the last five years. These laws typically include provisions directing a licensing board to recognize military training, education, and experience toward the requirements for the license, so long as it is substantially equivalent. While some laws apply to all licensing boards, many others are specific to a certain profession. Though there are many laws, veterans still encounter delays, cost, and confusion. Implementation is a challenge given how complex the state licensure system is. Laws affecting military spouses often include one or more of the following approaches, licensure by endorsement, temporary licensure, and expedited review. Legislation on occupational licensing hasn't slowed. In 2017, more than 92 bills were introduced in 35 states. I've also included a few other policy options on this slide, private veteran hiring preference, employer tax credits, female veteran programs and offices, and college credit for military service. I think I'm running short on time, so I'm going to hand it over now to Becky Pierius to discuss our second population, people with a criminal history. Good afternoon. My name is Becky Pierius, and I'm a policy analyst in the criminal justice program at NCSL. For my piece of the webinar, I'll be focusing on barriers to occupational licensing for individuals with, with a criminal history. I want to quickly point out that this population is often broader than ex-offenders, since criminal history includes not only convictions, but also arrests. In employment decisions, criminal background checks are becoming more commonplace and are easier to obtain through online databases. It's now estimated that 70 to 100 million adults in the U.S. have a criminal record. Nationwide studies show that persons of color are disproportionately represented in this population group since they are more likely to be stopped, arrested, or convicted than their white counterparts. The studies also show that racial disparities in the criminal justice system carry over to employment and licensing decisions that are based on criminal records. The EEOC issued an enforcement guidance document stating that criminal record exclusions that disproportionately impact people of color may be actionable under Title VII as a form of racial discrimination in employment unless it can be shown that the records are directly related to the job. With this in mind, I'd like to focus on the specific challenges that this population group faces when trying to obtain an occupational license. First, to provide some context, a database housed by the Justice Center has identified more than 27,000 state occupational licensing restrictions based on criminal records. This encompasses more than just state statutes, but it gives you an idea of the overall challenge. Some of these restrictions are blanket bans, which bar certain ex offenders automatically from receiving an occupational license. In this category, for example, a statute might ban anyone with a felony sex conviction from being licensed to run a daycare. Also, many restrictions don't limit the use of older convictions. This presents a challenge because an arrest that occurred when a person was 18 could impact a person's ability to get, the pro to get a professional license 10, 20, or 30 years later. Another challenge is the use of permanent and mandatory restrictions. 
These restrictions limit opportunities to show rehabilitation or to present mitigating factors. For example, the, a dental board may be required to deny a license to an individual with a felony theft con conviction. So this person could end up with a lifetime disqualification even though he or she was 18 at the time of the offense, a mitigating factor, and has since completed college and has had steady work for 10 years, a showing of rehabilitation. These restrictions, the automatic bans, use of older convictions, and permanent and mandatory restrictions may conflict with the EEOC guidance stating that criminal record restrictions must be directly related to the position. To provide guidance for employers and states, the EEOC lists several best practices for hiring and licensing decisions, such as using individual assessments that consider the nature of the crime, how much time has elapsed since the offense, and any rehabilitation on, part, on the part of the offender or mitigating factors. In general, the broad issue of collateral sanctions has certainly been on legislatures, legislators' radar. And for occupational licensing, we're seeing several trends. First, states have enacted legislation to reduce the use of restrictions that automatically ban a person from getting an occupational license. And in the same vein, states are implementing more EEOC uh, directly related factors. Overall, more than half of the states currently have some direct relationship requirement in law. And some state statutes also outline what factors a board should consider when determining if a conviction is directly related, which is helpful to both decision makers and applicants. We've also seen states implement the use of certificates of rehabilitation or employability. These laws authorize courts or parole boards to issue certificates as proof of rehabilitation and to allow some licensing disqualifications to be lifted. More than a dozen states have such certificates. Finally, a few states are addressing the use of older convictions and arrest records. Currently, four states limit the use of older records, and in six states, the use of arrest records is prohibited or restricted in licensing decisions. So as some recent examples, just this year, Kentucky and Louisiana both enacted legislation aimed at reducing barriers for this population. In Kentucky, their statute already specifies criteria to be used in making licensing decisions based on criminal records, and the new law requires that they also consider how much time has elapsed since the commission of the offense. The new law also requires written notice prior to a board's license denial that includes an explanation and allows the applicant the chance to request a hearing. And lastly, the new law repealed the statute that allowed denial of a license on the basis of lack of good moral character. And just a few months ago, Louisiana passed legislation that streamlines the licensing process for ex-offenders. It also removes waiting periods to get a license and eliminates the use of provisional licenses, reducing hurdles an ex-offender faces to get a license. So I hope this information has been informative, and I'm going to now turn it over to my colleague, Ann Morse. Hi, thanks. So, Rebecca, that was lovely. Um, this is Ann Morris, and I staff NCSL's immigrant policy work, and also direct the staff of the Task Force on Immigration in the States. I'm really happy to be part of this new project with our partners and look forward to learning from all of you. Um, the Task Force on Immigration in the States has been working on uh, uh, this issue for some time now. We've been trying to understand the role of immigrants in state economies and on state tax uh, tax revenues. Um, we've benefited from briefings by groups such as the New American Economy, World Education Services, Upwork at Global, the Welcome Back Initiative, immigrant business owners and employers of immigrants, and a number of research organizations. The key focus of this work has been on demographics in the workforce and the need to attract and retain skilled professionals, including immigrants, to fill current vacancies in areas with labor shortages, as well as new vacancies as baby boomers begin to retire. Finally, there's recognition of the need to build capacity for the anticipated service needs of these baby boomers after they retire, such as health care. This is an occupation where one in four healthcare professionals is currently an immigrant. The DOL project focus uh, to re restate is skilled immigrants that have authorization to work in the United States. Um, one example, um, there are now 13 million uh, immigrant professionals, and that's about 16% of the U.S. workforce. This is up from 5% in the 
70s at about 5 million, and we're now up to 13 million, as I said. The areas where they tend to concentrate have been in high-tech, uh, information technology, uh, healthcare professionals, and they're also in low-skilled workforces, such as construction, food services, and agriculture. Um, one of the areas that I want to highlight today in today's research has been around college graduates. Um, there are now 45.6 million college graduates in the U.S. labor force overall. 7.6 um, million or 17% of these are foreign-born, and almost one in four of those foreign-born college-educated gra graduates are underemployed or unemployed. So this is talent that we can be capitalized. It's already in the country working legally. Um, as was stated in the introduction, there are several normal barriers. Uh, I think I'm supposed to be, oh, thanks, somebody's advancing for me. Thank you. Um, some of the barriers that have been mentioned in the introduction were difficulty gaining recognition for their foreign education or their credentials, um, some limited English language of proficiency, some lack of familiarity with licensing requirements in the United States, and some skills deficit for jobs in the United States where they may have had a gap since their education and they need to advance, such as in healthcare or engineering. What are some of the benefits of capitalizing on these immigrant professionals? Um, MPI has estimated that $39 billion in lost earnings for the immigrants working in low-skilled profession positions instead of in their field. This could change a result in tax revenues that would increase of $7 billion in federal taxes and $3 billion in state and local taxes from the poor, poor earnings on these immigrants. And they also can help fill labor shortages in key industries. I want to highlight just a couple of examples for you. Um, in Minnesota in 2015, the state passed legislation to help integrate immigrant physicians to address barriers in the state and alleviate shortages for primary care in rural and underserved areas. And in Michigan, there was a collaboration in the executive agencies of the State Office for New Americans with uh, nonprofit Upwardly Global and the Department of Licensing and Regulatory Affairs to make their licensing guides clearer for all residents in the states for 44 professions and to work specifically with immigrant professionals to make sure that they could capitalize on, on that access. Um, I just give, that's just a few highlights of the work that we're doing. Uh, if you wanted to see our past experience, we have a, an issue brief online at www.ncsl. Um, org slash imig, I-M-M-I-G, and we've also done a webinar with some of our state legislators that talk about the legislation they passed in their states, and I look forward to working with you all. Thank you very much, and now let me turn it over to Joanne. Hi there, I am Joellen Kralik, and I am a policy specialist in NCSL's education program. And I work on our projects connecting students to the workforce along college and career pathways. So the part of this occupational licensing project that I'm working on is looking at how unemployed and dislocated workers in particular are burdened or negatively impacted by occupational licensing requirements. So I'm going to start off by defining um, this particular population group, and then we're going to look at some data that shows how um, unemployed workers with licenses are um, faring compared to unemployed workers without licenses. Then we are going to talk about the particular barriers that this population group faces when getting licenses, and then we're going to take a look at state action. So getting started, when we're talking about unemployed and dislocated workers, what we're talking about is this definition first that you're probably familiar with for unemployed. These are people who are jobless, they're actively seeking work, and they're available to take a job. A term that you might not be as familiar with is dislocated worker. Um, and dislocated workers are under the umbrella of unemployed workers, but they have found themselves in one of the following situations. So perhaps they've been laid off or received a last notice from their job. They might be receiving unemployment benefits after being laid off, or they might be in the process of losing a job and are unlikely return to return to the previous occupation. These could also be people that used to be self-employed but are now unemployed due to economic conditions and a natural disaster, or they might be previous stay-at-home moms and dads that are trying to break back into the labor market and might be having a little bit of trouble. So now that we know who we're talking about, what difference does licensure make for people who are unemployed and dislocated? So 
We're going to take a look at some numbers that will help us get a better understanding of this. In 2015, nine, uh, the unemployment rate for adults ages 18 to 35, and these are folks who didn't have a license and they also didn't have a college degree, so among them it was 9.9%. Now if we look at the unemployment rate for adults who are the same age, so these are also folks that don't have a degree but they actually do have a license, the unemployment rate is almost half of that. When looking at older workers, when they lose a job, they workers who are older than 45 are unemployed for longer periods of time than the younger workers that we were just talking about. But on top of that, those without a license have periods of unemployment lasting 40% longer than older workers with licenses. So what this data is telling us is that younger workers with occupational licenses are less likely to be employed and older workers who have been dislocated, um, with those that have an occupational license are going to find themselves in a shorter period of unemployment than if they don't. So it seems like the answer um, would be for more unemployed and dislocated workers to obtain occupational licenses. But that is easier said than done for a lot of these folks because there are some barriers that are particularly burdensome or challenging for unemployed and dislocated workers. And those barriers? Our time and money. So people faced with unemployment tend to be on a pretty tight budget and meeting occupational licensing requirements can be pretty costly. And so when we're looking at this, um, what we need to keep in mind is the cost of attending classes and trainings. Many of these classes cost money to attend. We also need to think about the cost of not working while attending classes and training. License, licensure fees also can be expensive and so can the cost of taking exams. So next, we're going to take a look at how these barriers manifest themselves. So there was a study of 102 licensed occupations across the state, and it was kind of looking at what are the average requirements um, to, to obtain an occupational licensure. And so we're looking at a ni nine months spent um, getting education and training, we're looking at $209 in licensing fees just for the initial license and one exam. So when we look at the averages, that doesn't really tell the whole story. So let's go ahead and look at what this looks like for two particular jobs that are widely licensed across the state. So for barbers, the range of days of education can range from 175 days to 890 days. And so if you're not really familiar with your you know, day to year ratio, 890 days is about two and a half years. So if you're in one of the states with the lower number of uh, required training or one of the higher ends of training, that's really going to impact you if money is tight and you're looking to get into a job. Looking at um, the preschool teacher example for licensing fees, that range, so the range is goes from $0 to $250. And again, that's a pretty big range. If money is already tight, $250 is going to be a huge lift for you. But if you're in a state that the licensure fee is only is, is free, it doesn't cost any money, um, that's much less of a barrier to get into the profession. And we also see um, quite a, a bit of ranges and differences in the amount of exams taken. And it's pretty interesting that in some states, um, we have to to interpret this data, that means that you have to take more tests to become a barber than you would to become a preschool teacher, which doesn't maybe seem like the most um, intuitive situation. All right, so many states and, policies and the policymakers therein are already aware uh, that occupational, occupational licensure needs a little bit of work, and they're taking actions to remove some of these barriers. So we're going to take a look at that. So the first bill is Arizona House Bill 2372, and this was just passed this year. And what this bill does is it waives initial licensing fees for first-time applicants whose family income does not exceed 200% of the poverty guideline. So this effort is specific to targeting low-income, unemployed, and dislocated workers. The next two bills that we are looking at here today are more comprehensive general reforms, and, the, the, and they both come from two of our consortium states. So Delaware, actually, this actually came from executive order, and it established a state professional licensing review committee that charged them with studying what 
the practices are on occupational licensing in their state to come up with recommendations to remove some of these challenges for um, across all licenses and all populations. And then Utah House Bill 94 expanded the oversight powers of an existing legislative committee dedicated to occupational licensing. And it's pretty cool because this one looks at creating they're looking at creating opportunity for a broader discussion about how the public interest can best be served. So the concluding points that you want to kind of remember from this particular popula population group are that being licensed makes a difference. People with licenses have lower rates of unemployment, and they're unemployed for shorter stretches of time. The second point is that occupational licenses require time and money, and this can be a barrier for unemployed and dislocated workers who are short on either time or money. And lastly, that state action to remove such barriers to employment can be targeted or broad, and it can be driven by legislation or regulatory reform. So if you have any questions, I would be happy to help you out. And if I don't know the answer, I will look it up or connect you with the right person to talk to. You. And with that, I will transition to my colleague, Iris. All right. Well, thanks to all of our experts for coming in today and speaking um, on all four of these target populations. Um, I think if we want to go ahead and open it up to question and answer time now, we can do that. Um, and I'm thinking maybe we should start with the last question that we got about what role should slash can post-secondary institutions play in helping these populations foresee or navigate occupational licensing requirements. Um, so I'm guessing, this is Joellen, and I'm guessing that question is for me. And we are not going to answer the question of what role should post-secondary institutions play, um, but what role could they play is something that we could look into. That's not information that I have already, but I would be happy to look it up, and we can link that to the resources that are associated with this webinar and make sure that we're including it in future um, publications and resources. Uh, and this is Suzanne, and I will just add to this that we've been seeing um, more and more uh, universities and different types of col um, college systems get into um, the whole credential and certificate arena. So from uh, bachelor's degrees, associate's degrees, any type of short-term, long-term credentials and licensing, and they're collecting more and more information on this. And so we think this is something that um, more colleges and universities will probably become interested in, and we might um, be able to identify a lot more information on this topic um, over the three years of this project. So thank you for the question. Great. Thanks, Joellen and Suzanne, for your responses to that question. Um, and then I think we might as well go ahead and circle back to the question that was asked by Jake towards the beginning of this webinar um, about what are the most common types of occupational licenses that have reciprocity agreements between the states to allow for mobility. And I can just start off by saying that we at um, NCSL, along with our partners at NGA and CSG, have been working on a licensure database where we're collecting um, data for 34 occupations to try to tease out um, some of these things, such as which occupations are best for reciprocity between the states. Um, and that information will be available uh, by the end of the year. Um, we will note that there are this one right here. Yeah. Um, there are a couple occupations that tend to stand out, um, including those in the health fields. Uh, and our partners at CSG collect a lot of information on uh, compact agreements, and that's something that this project will be looking more into in the second year of this project, so in 2018. So we'll have a lot more information on that. But as Iris mentioned, we're currently collecting data on the reciprocity of these 34 um, occupations that we've identified. And I will actually quickly note um, the three partner organizations have identified 34 occupations, and they are available on our web page, which is ncsl.org slash states license. We identified these 34 occupations as requiring less than a four-year degree being licensed in 30 or more states and then having a greater than average projected growth rate. And so these are the occupations that um, we'll be spending a lot of time working on. Again, any of our 11 consortium states might select other occupations that they want to identify that 
um, are not part of our research, but uh, these other 34 occupations are, are what we will be compiling. Um, we are compiling data on and will comprise our database. All right, Suzanne, thanks for um, that response. Let me see. Looks like the next question is from Manny, um, and it is, is there an asset map of all of the state's policies um, that has been enacted or that have been enacted um, for these target populations? So I want to say that there might be an asset map for veterans' policies um, on our website. Uh, on our website, I believe we have a summary of 2017 legislation that's been introduced. Um, I'm not sure we've posted a map, but I have been tracking since 2014 all of these states um, enacted legislation involving occupational licensing. Many states have enacted more than one law. Um, and that's something uh, maybe in the future that we'll be looking to get up on the web in addition to the other resources from this project. OK, and I'll just open it up to the rest of our subject matter experts. Uh, Rebecca, if you want to go ahead. Hi, this is Becky Furious. Um, there is a document. It, it's a little bit older. It's July of 2011. It's on the criminal justice website. It's called Ex-Offender Employment Opportunities. And there is a map. Um, that goes over the states that regulate the use of criminal records, including licensing. Uh, so that may be some information you can find. And also to note, the database that we are putting together, we have looked at, um, we have certain questions that, I, that address these four different populations. Uh, and so there will be some of this information included in that database as well. All right, great. Thank you, everyone. Um, and now to test the final question that we have received from all of our audience participants uh, from Michael. To what extent are the national professional organizations addressing the challenge of reducing barriers to licensing by the populations that you've addressed here? This is Suzanne, and I will say that we have been um, contacted and, and reaching out to many different professional um, uh, organizations, especially those that are listed among those 34 uh, occupations. And currently, we're just finding out more about um, what their current initiatives are. I don't know if anyone in the certain um, population groups has more on any specific occupations. Uh, well, this is Ann Morse, and I'd just like to mention two of the groups that we've been working with uh, with the Task Force Innovation in the States, our National uh, New American Economy, which has been helping to identify immigrant professionals by state and research on what occupations they're in and the value of their uh, talents, as well as the World Education Services, who is a credentialing evalu evaluation organization that's been helping uh, professionals translate their foreign, tra foreign education and training for U.S. employers, and so they've, they've got some good data online, and we've been happy to find some more uh, groups that have been tracking legislation. We also have an immigration database online, as well as the brief on occupational licensing for immigrants. So that's a starter place. We certainly have more to do. All right, great. Thank you, Anne. And Jennifer, did you have? Uh, sure. I would just say that the Department of Defense is very aware of the challenges that uh, veterans are facing. Um, and also the Defense State Liaison Office is uh, tracking what the states are doing as far as reducing the barriers for military spouses. Okay. Oh, oh go ahead, Rebecca. Hi, I was just going to point out a couple um, really good resources out there on collateral consequences and criminal records, and that's the Justice Center. Um, they have a collateral, collateral consequence database uh, that goes through all the different state licenses and statutes, and then also the Collateral Consequences Resource Center has a lot of information that is useful. Okay, thank you so much, Rebecca. Let's see. We got another question. Let's see. Did we? All 
Uh, well, we did just want to recognize uh, that the Federal Trade Commission is also working on um, occupational licensing, and so they also have some uh, resources available on their site. Um, and so we've been um, in regular conversations with them. So just a reminder, if you do have a question, you can type it into that box in the left-hand corner. Um, but we have a few questions already developed here that we can go ahead and continue our conversation with. Um, so this one is for Becky about individuals with criminal histories. Um, how many states can still deny a license because a person lacked good moral character or committed a crime of moral turpitude? Um, so going back to the resource I just mentioned, the Justice Center's Collateral Consequence Database, I was looking through there and found that all states still use some form of this language, either um, allowing denials based on good mor lack of good moral character or if they've committed a crime of moral turpitude. And this is problematic because um, it's unclear language and it can provide unfettered discretion for a board or employer to decide what crimes show these different characters. All right, thank you so much for that, Becky. Um, and then a question for Jen about military veterans and their spouses. Um, how many service members are discharged every year, and where do they end up going once they are discharged? Thanks, Iris. Uh, so roughly 200,000 service members are discharged every year. The majority have served five years or less. Um, for military retirement, it actually takes 20 years. Uh, as far as where they're going, I've seen one study of Army veterans that found 60% go back to their home state, 20% move to another state, and 20% stay right around the last base that they served. Great. Thanks so much, Jen. Right. OK, well, that looks to be all the questions that we have um, right now. We appreciate all of you joining us for this webinar. And as a reminder, this webinar will be is being recorded and will be available within the next couple of days online. So thank you. Thank you. This does conclude today's webinar. We thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect your lines at this time, and have a great day.